Okay, so in the last video, we talked about the fact that uh, the electron density around the nuclei changes uh, the induced magnetic field uh, that happens when we throw these molecules in an externally applied magnetic field. That changes the uh, separation of the energy levels uh, that we can probe uh, by looking at the frequency of which a photon is either emitted or absorbed uh, to convert between those two spin states. So we talk about things with uh, a lot of electronegative groups on them that de-shields the electron density around the, both the carbon and the hydrogens that are very close to those electronegative uh, groups. And if we have very few electronegative groups that there's more electron density around these and we can distinguish between these two with the, our magnetic spectrometer. And that happens uh, because we apply a magnetic field there's an induced magnetic field because of the electron density around those nuclei, and then that changes the magnetic field that is felt by uh, the nuclei that we're probing. So if we have a lot of electron density around our nuclei we're probing, in this instance uh, hydrogen nuclei, then our resultant magnetic field is quite small. That's the beta effective. And if we have less electron density, that induced magnetic field is smaller, so that the resulted effective magnetic field that's felt by that nuclei is much larger. And we can distinguish between these two different nuclei. Uh, and there's a lot of range we can distinguish between many different nuclei. So, in this video and in the next couple of videos, we're going to take a look at what that actually means uh, in our NMR spectra. So an NMR spectra gives us four types of information. It tells us how many unique proton environments the molecule has. This is reflected in the number of signals. We're going to take a look at these other three uh, in the next two or three videos. So. Uh, we won't worry about them. The first thing we can tell from an NMR spectrum is how many unique proton environments the molecule has. So right away, if I look at this particular NMR spectrum, now we want to be a little careful, we're going to learn about this later, but this series of three lines here, that's just one signal. That's just due to one signal. The fact that it gives three lines tells gives me another kind of information that's reflected uh, in these areas down here. Uh, but we have one signal there. This one, which is seems to be from about four lines, that's another signal. And finally, down here, uh, this is actually a little bit complicated because we could say that this has three signals. But this one is actually more than one. So in reality, we have, uh, this is actually due, it's actually three signals itself. So we actually have five signals in this spectrum. Now, don't worry too much about that. You can't really tell uh, just yet, but I can see that this is more than one signal and we can actually expand that by, in our spectrometer, we can span it much more and we can see how many signals are, are in there. So we're gonna take a look at these things uh, in this short video. So first of all, the number of signals in an HNMR spectrum is dependent, dependent on the number of different uh, kinds of protons in a compound. If the, if the protons or the hydrogen atoms are the same, we will only see one signal. So in ethane, for example, even though we have two carbons and each carbon has three hydrogens on it, all of those hydrogens are identical. And we can see that from the symmetry of this molecule. So this would only give us one signal. If we take a look at this molecule, same thing. This is dimethyl ether. We have a plane of symmetry right there. So this also 
would only give us one signal. Because these protons are exactly the same. Whenever we have the symmetry in our molecule, we can tell. Here we have some more symmetry. This is the same, also one signal. And as it turns out, all of these molecules are going to give us one signal because of the symmetry of their molecules. Let's take a look at things that give us more than one signal. So here's a good example. Notice now we don't have symmetry. On this side, we have a CH3 group that's attached to a carbonyl. And on this side, this CH3 group is not attached to a carbonyl. It's attached to an ester oxygen. So this molecule would give us two signals. It has uh, two sets of protons. Each of these three protons are the same, but they're different. They're in a different environment than these set of protons. Get used to the fact that when we talk about uh, proton NMR spectroscopy, we are interchanging proton and hydrogen atom sometimes uh, because it's actually the nuclei we're looking at. And for a hydrogen atom with a mass of one, there's only a proton in the nuclei. That's why we talk about it as being proton NMR spectroscopy. So let's take a look at this molecule now. Uh, we have a CH3 group. We have a CH group. And we have protons on the nitrogen. So we actually have three sets of protons in this molecule. And we expect to see three signals in our NMR spectrum. This molecule, oh, it has a lot. There's, there's very little symmetry in this molecule. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four different chemical environments we expect to see four signals. So you want to be able to look at molecules and their symmetry uh, to be able to get some idea as to how many uh, signals we're going to see. So again, here we have a molecule that has very little symmetry. So we have protons on one, two, three, four different carbons. All of them are different. This carbon is attached to an oxygen. It's a phosphate ester oxygen. This molecule is attached to two carbons, but it's attached to two different kinds of carbon. This carbon is quite different than this carbon because this carbon is bonded to an oxygen and this one is not. Uh, so these are distinct chemical environment for these protons. The same here, we have a CH3 group. We actually only have one CH3 group. It's easy to see that it's quite different. Uh, and finally, our CH2 group is also different. So we have four sets of protons for this thing. Now take a look. We have a lot of different protons in this particular molecule because there is no symmetry. I want to take draw here an example of a molecule that has some symmetry but also has We'll see more examples of this. But notice, uh, I'm going to put my plane of symmetry in blue. We have a plane of symmetry that goes through this molecule right here. Actually, I can make it a straight line by going. I'm supposed to be able to. There we go. So we have a plane of symmetry right there. I'm going to make this a long bond because that blue line is interfering. But take a look at that. We can easily see that these three 
hydrogens on that methyl group are all the same. And we can see that this hydrogen and this hydrogen are the same. They're both attached to a carbon that's attached to this carbon that's attached to the CH3 group. These are different. And this one is different yet again. Okay, so these two are the same. These two are the same. And then this one doesn't have any other like it, so it's by itself. So this particular molecule, we would expect to see a signal here. We would expect to see another signal these two, let's connect them, we would expect to see a signal for these two and a signal for this. So this would give us four signals as well. Take a read of your textbook to make sure that you can tell these different protons about from each other when we take a look at molecules. So let's take a look at this molecule. We have a 4,4-dimethyl-2-pentanone. Well, it's a ketone, okay? Uh, there's no very little symmetry in the molecule, but we do see that these three methyl groups are all the same. They're all attached to this carbon. So we should expect to see one signal for nine protons. And we should expect this CH2 group it's different than all the other ones. We should have one signal for those two protons. And finally, another signal for those three protons. So we expect to see in all three signals. And we see that. We see this great big one. This corresponds to the nine protons. And you'll learn how I know that's nine protons in a bit, although it may be obvious because it's so big. But as it turns out, this one here is due to the three protons That's this signal. And this one to that. Now, we haven't quite, we'll get into this later, but notice as well that uh, this one, which is right here, is attached to an electronegative group, the carbonyl's electronegative group. This one's also attached to an electronegative group. We find it there. Notice they're slightly different. They're attached to the same group, but this one is also attached to uh, another carbon. This one is not. So it's slightly different. And then these three methyl groups are furthest away from the electronegative group. And we find it down here in this area that we said was uh, shielded. And over here, these is more deshielded. Okay. So... Already you can tell that I can kind of predict where they might be. A little bit of confusion between these, the CH2 and the CH3 group, uh, but we'll get past that as well. To test if two protons are chemically equivalent, just replace each with another group and compare the two new molecules. We call this the substitution test. So if we take these two protons and we take one, and instead of the proton, we make it a Cl. Uh, and then we do the same with the other one. These are two different molecules. Uh, as I'm sorry, these are not. Uh, the structures A and B are identical. We talk about these as being homotopic. If now, and that's because they both have a methyl group there. If we change that methyl group to a pH group, now these are different. We talk about these as being 
enantiotopic, right? Uh, if we were to assign, we'd see we have an R and an S enantiomer in these two. So we talk about these hydrogens as being enantiotopic. Turns out they're chemically equivalent. They will give the same signal. Even though these are slightly different, the fact that they're enantiotopic, remember enantiomers don't have different chemical properties. They only differ in the way they interact with uh, polarized light. So, to test if two, two photons, protons are chemically equivalent, we do this substitution test. Let's take a look here. And we're going to replace these two with chlorine. So we get this one versus this one. So this is a chiral center. This is now a chiral center. We talk about the fact that these two compounds are different. They're diastereomers. So these protons are diastereotopic, right? Because if we were to change them, we don't have, this doesn't have diastereomers, but if we change one of those protons, we would get diastereomers. They are chemically different then. These two uh, protons will give different signals. Now we're going to exchange one of these and one of these. And if we do that, we change this one or we change this one. Now we see that we have a chlorine right next to the carbon that's bonded to the phenyl group. And over here, that's two away from the carbon that's the phenyl group. We talk about these as being heterotopic. Uh, we may be a little more precise and say that they're constitutionally heterotopic because these are constitutional isomers. They're different compounds. They would actually have different chemical properties and physical properties. Uh, these kinds of protons are chemically inequivalent and will give different signals. These will give uh, the same signal. They will not give different signals because they're the same kind of protons. Now if we take a look at this particular molecule, I'll use blue again. We have a plane of symmetry there so that we can see that I'm going to circle these two are the same. These two are the same. And these two are the same. We get three signals. Uh, for this particular one, because we now have uh, H there, we still have that same plane of symmetry. Uh, I'm going to use my laser. We have a plane of symmetry right down here, that red line, okay? That CH3 and that CH3 group are chemically equivalent. This hydrogen and this hydrogen are chemically equivalent. This hydrogen is different, and it's also different from this hydrogen. So expect to see four signals. Uh, and now this one, two signals. So you should be able to figure that out uh, when you do this. So that's it for uh, the first set. That tells us the different set of signals. The next video, we're going to take a look at the environment of each signal and what causes it to change.